All right, so hi everyone. My name is Cara Fernandez. I work at the Quag Wildlife Refuge as Program Director and really excited to share with you some information on spring wildlife babies. And it's really important to know what kind of animals live around us in our backyards and parks so that we can be prepared if we ever see a wildlife baby or see an injured animal that we know what to do and how best to help them because it can be variable depending on the species. So Wildlife times the birth of their young depending on the resources that are available. So that's why most wildlife, um, birds, mammals, reptiles are born in the springtime because there's more food resources for them and there might be um, warmer weather and that usually coincides with when the wildlife are born so that they have an easier time surviving. So this is an awesome picture that was taken by um, Byron Young who's involved with e Eastern Long Island Audubon Society of a mom and three baby chipmunks. So today we're going to cover how to help wildlife, when to intervene for the native species that we have on Long Island. So birds, mammals, reptiles, and then we'll give you some resources for how to contact a wildlife rehabilitator, when to contact a wildlife rehabilitator, and some other ways that we can help wildlife. But if anyone is new to the refuge, some information about the Quag Wildlife Refuge. We are a 305 acre nonprofit nature preserve located in Quag. And we, our mission is to educate um, folks about the environment. So we do a lot of teaching on site here at the refuge with our wildlife that we take care of, some of which are permanently injured. We also go off site to schools and libraries and teach um, across Long Island as well. So here we are out in Quag on the South Fork of Long Island. And I'm in our nature center right now. This is our nature center building that overlooks Old Ice Pond. And we have some exhibits on the inside of the nature center building. And seven miles of hiking trails. And we're open from sunrise to sunset every single day. So you can come and visit the trails. You might see a lot of great native wildlife. I tried to include in this presentation a lot of pictures that were taken here at the Wildlife Refuge. So here at the refuge, we provide um, housing to permanently injured wildlife or animals that were non-releasable. They were wild. And then unfortunately, because of their injuries, um, couldn't be released back into the wild. But we don't do wildlife rehabilitation here. So we don't um, take in injured animals like some other organizations do, but we field a lot of questions from the public. And that's why we are so excited to put this program out so that we can spread the word on what to do if you do find uh, wildlife around you. So it, one really important thing to remember is that most animals are not orphans. So most wildlife that you see will not need any help. So that's great news because the best spot for any wild animal to be is in the wild. And they can learn so much more, so much better from their wild parents than they can from people. So it's always most important to remember that most animals are not orphaned and that if you, we say, if you care, leave it there. So if you care, the best thing to do is to always leave it in the wild. Um, we actually have some animals that we take care of that were illegally kept as pets or taken from the wild and kept for such a long time that they either became imprinted on people or became so habituated to people that they could not be released. And that's really sad because otherwise physically they are fine and they could go into the wild, but they just don't know how to hunt. So it is really important to leave animals in the wild. Um, so if you see a fully furred animal that has its eyes open and that it doesn't need any help from people. So that's great news. And um, even if you don't see a parent around, that doesn't mean that they're not there. So even if you don't see a mother or even two birds, parent birds around a mother and a father, um, it doesn't mean that they're not there. They could actually just be alarmed by your presence and be staying far away. So um, the moms are usually around and just hiding and trying to make sure to hide their babies. So in New York State, it is illegal to take care of any wild animal if you're not a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So um, you cannot keep any wildlife legally without being a certified wildlife rehabilitator. So you have to go through a process and get a permit to become a wildlife rehabilitator. And the goal is always of wildlife rehab is to 
release them back into the wild so that they can be in the wild population and have a normal life. If you do find an animal uh, that needs care, we'll kind of cover each species, but it's very important to never feed or give water to any wild animal, especially one that's injured or one that is young because they could aspirate and it could impede future treatment. So it's important if an animal truly does need help that you should never feed them um, and leave that to the trained professionals. All right, so we're gonna start with birds today and then we'll move on to mammals and reptiles. But some birds are born in nests, of course. I think that's commonly what we think of when we think of eggs and chicks that are hatching in a cup-shaped nest. Others though are born in tree cavities or on the ground. So if you ever see an egg on the ground, um, I know I've personally seen that as well, a fully formed egg that is out of the nest. Um, it's important that you don't wanna bring it home and put it in, in an incubator. It's actually illegal due to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, it's illegal to relocate nests and to tamper with nests, eggs, or birds. So if you do see one, it's uh, on, the, on the ground, it's important to leave it. It could be a net, uh, an egg that the parent knew was not going to hatch. They might've shoved it out of the nest. So that happens sometimes. So it's important just to respect the circle of life and maybe another animal will come along and eat the egg. So birds have some different strategies when, uh, depending on their species for survival. Some chicks are born at the end of this scale. If you look to the left, some birds are born, it's called precocial. And that means that they hatch in a fledgling stage. So their eyes are open. Uh, they start walking soon after they hatch. So sometimes just within hours, they'll start walking when they hatch. Um, they have downy feathers and usually they leave the nest within two, around two to three days. So can anyone think of a precocial bird in our area? And I'll keep talking about the other end of the spectrum. So some birds that are altricial, you can see at the top of that arrow on this sliding scale, the altricial birds are born with their eyes closed. They don't have many downy feathers. They need a lot of parental care. So there's usually a really well-formed nest and the parents feed them more than in precocial birds. Um, so in North America, the birds that we see are there. We have the three levels, um, precocial, altricial, and um, super altricial. But there is a bird in Australia, which I found was really interesting. It's called the Australian Mallee fowl, and it doesn't need any parental care. So when it hatches um, in Australia, it can fly after it hatches and it needs no parental care. So I just thought that was really interesting. But the birds that we see in North America will be having at least some parental care. And exactly, so one, one bird that's precocial is a duck. So when you think of a duck hatching out of an egg, they uh, are born with downy feathers or they hatch with downy feathers. Their eyes are open and they rely on a little less parental care, but they follow their parents right away. So they will learn instinctually, um, but also from their parents. So some birds that are altricial, are um, hawks and owls. They are usually born with some downy hair though, but they do need parental care, as well as other songbirds, passerines, herons, hummingbirds, and woodpeckers. All of those birds are altricial. So on this screen, you can see these are some pictures of birds, uh, the differences between species. So it is important to know what species you're dealing with if you do see um, some wildlife in your backyard to know if they need help because we know that a, a young robin is born with their eyes closed and will develop their feathers under some parental care. So if you find a bird that's eyes are closed and it has not many feathers and it might need some care still from its parents and if it doesn't have its parents around we'll tell you what to do. So on this screen, on the left is, a, is ducklings and then the American robin, and on the right was a cooper's hawk. So one really common word that you 
want to remember these two words are nestlings or fledglings. So we want to know if you see a bird that you suspect might need help or you're trying to determine if it needs any help from you, um, you can think, is it a nestling or is it a fledgling? So nestlings, they might be in the stage of an altricial bird anyway, with their eyes closed, not many feathers, and should still be in their nest. While fledglings are supposed to be leaving the nest, they should have downy feathers, they're hopping around, and they still will receive some parental care because they can't fly yet. So on the right hand side, that's a fledgling robin. And that bird is supposed to be out of the nest and learning. It's kind of like a soft release from the nest. They're hopping around trying to forage on their own, but their parents will come back every maybe every hour, every 20 minutes, depending on what species and feed them. So a fledgling bird doesn't need any help. Um, a nestling bird, if you find it out of the nest, it might need help. So if you do find a baby bird, the first thing to ask yourself is, is it a nestling or is it a fledgling, right? Again, fledglings, they're hopping around, their eyes are open, they might have a stubby tail, but they don't need any help. Um, and of a nestling though, like the one on the left-hand side, might not have many feathers, it's not hopping around, it will need some, some help. So what you can do to best help them is, of course, never feed or give them water, but you can try putting them back into the nest. If you, if you know that this bird came from the nest that's in the tree above your, you know, above your deck, you can put the bird back into the nest gently without overhandling it, but it's actually a myth that birds will abandon their chicks if they smell that you touch them. So that's not true. A lot of birds don't have very well developed olfactory glands, so they really can't smell very well and they won't smell um, you on their baby, on their chick. So, um, and then of course, if you do find an, a nestling that you can't find the nest or, or it's injured, visibly injured and you see blood or, or it's not alert, um, you can definitely call a wildlife rehabilitator and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but some other birds that are nest earlier in the season than songbirds are like this great horned owl. These are some pictures that were taken at the refuge one year. Um, and this is a great horned owl this is a nestling. So you can see it has all those downy feathers. It still needs to be in parental care because it can't fly or hunt on its own yet. So it's still learning. And again, it is um, illegal to destroy, relocate, or possess any wild birds, their eggs, or their nests. So um, under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, all of these birds are protected. So goslings and ducklings uh, are a common bird that you may see, especially in the springtime. So these pictures were taken at the refuge. They're of Canada geese. And then at the bottom of the screen, those are wood ducks. And you can usually around the same time every year see families of geese or ducks. And actually the bottom picture was taken on April 28th in 2020. The top picture was on April 27th of 2020. So the end of April is usually when we'll see goslings, at least here at the refuge and across Long Island too. And I wanted to just tell one story really quickly before we move on from goslings and ducklings, but the picture on the left, one of those goslings actually got separated from the family. And um, because some of our staff are wildlife rehabilitators, we were actually able to just put the baby back with the family and reintroduce them to the family without being seen. And right away, the baby ran up to the parents. So it is really important to know what to do, but also to never take them into your care and try to feed them and raise them as a gosling because they will get very confused and they may become imprinted on people. And um, most likely, if you do take one of the, the goslings home, um, they won't live a normal life. So in trying to help animals, we always have to say, if you care, leave them there. Or you can contact us. We can help you find a wildlife rehabilitator who can then eventually release the bird. One and another really important way to help wildlife, um, even though this isn't a baby, this is a full grown 
um, goose, but it's very important not to feed bread because it's so nutritionally poor for ducks and geese. So bread is actually a terrible food for them to eat um, because it's so delicious, right? I love bread full of carbs, um, but they also love to eat bread. It's just not good for them. So you can see this picture on the screen is a goose that has what's called um, the angel wing. And it's a deformity where when a goose or a duck or another bird is fed bread, it actually causes their wings to grow quicker than the rest of their body. And um, the one or both wings will droop or turn outwards. And it's a permanent syndrome or um, deformity. So it causes a twist in the wing feathers. Um, and the last flight feather will point outward and it is permanent in adult birds. So it can't be reversed and then they can never fly. So it's really important not to feed bread. Um, and we do have some angel wing geese that were released here and live here. And so you might see this in some, if you ever come visit the refuge and you'll see that we have some geese that have this angel wing. But again, um, really important not to feed bread. And also just um, as a side note, not to feed any wildlife because we change their behavior when we start to feed them. So we never want to feed wild animals. They have plenty of food out there in, um, in the wild for them. So another common call that we'll get is if a bird hits into your window or maybe hits into your car window and um, sometimes they become injured. And then in that case, it would be important to call a wildlife rehabilitator. But if a bird hits into your window, one thing that you can do is put it into a shoe box with holes in it. And in the shoe box, um, just don't put anything on the bottom or you can put like a, a paper towel, but just give the bird like 30 to 45 minutes to recover because sometimes they are stunned when they hit a window. Um, and then you can take the box outside and open up the box. And sometimes the bird is totally fine and they'll recover and fly away. So they just might need a minute to recover from being stunned. But if you do notice that a house, uh, your house windows are commonly being, um, you know, hit by birds, you can invest in some wildlife decals, they're called, or stickers to prevent bird strikes um, and prevent window collisions, because that is a really um, fr a frequent uh, mortality event for birds. So these were on Amazon, but you can make your own in certain seasons. If you notice that the birds are hitting your window, you can put up stickers, you can put up pieces of paper. Uh, there are lots of different options. All right, so uh, we covered birds. We are gonna jump into mammals now. And this is just a chart that I made to show when some of our most common wildlife are being born. So you can see in February, some wildlife like squirrels and possums can already be being born March, early March, and all the way through September. So now really is the season that wildlife babies are being born. And we're going to start with the eastern cottontail rabbit. So the eastern cottontail is our native rabbit species that lives on Long Island, and they can have one to nine babies, although four to five are more common. And they nest on the ground, so they'll nest in a depression in the ground that's lined with fur. They can be born in March all the way to September. Sometimes they can have two um, broods or two um, nests in a season. And mammals, of course, are born and they do need parental care. So they'll need care from their, their parents. And uh, they are sometimes born with fur. They are warm blooded and the babies drink milk. All right, so when baby rabbits are born, um, you can see that there, there can be many of them in that fur lined nest. And usually it'll be hidden maybe in a bush or underneath um, something. But um, these little babies will need some parental care. And occasionally people will come across nests that they think are abandoned. But it's really important to know that for rabbits, they will feed their young early in the morning and late at night. Sometimes they'll come back to the nest only two times a day. And that is to hide the nest from predators. So a predator would be able to see, uh, you know, 
see the baby, um, I'm sorry, see the adult better than the, the young. So it's important to make sure um, to remember that if you think that it's abandoned, it actually might not be abandoned. The, the, um, the mom might be nearby. So if you suspect though, that even with knowing that the rabbit parents will only return uh, twice a day, sometimes you suspect that the, that something happened to the parent, or if the nest had been abandoned, um, one thing that you can do is to put a little flower around the edge of the nest, or even to put yarn or twigs across the nest like this. And then the next day you can check to see if the flower had been smudged or if the yarn had been moved when the mom came back to feed her babies. So if all of that is moved, then that's great news because the mom is still in the area and is still uh, feeding the young. And then otherwise, it's very important to not pick up uh, any wild young or wild babies, especially wild rabbits, because of um, a thing called capture myop myopathy. So capture myopathy is just, um, unfortunately, some animals get so um, nervous if they're picked up, although they seem calm, it's very stressful and they can go into shock. And um, it's a condition that is caused from being chased or harassed or held and their heart stops and they can die. So it's really important not to pick up any young wildlife. Um, and this happens in rabbits too. So oftentimes people think that the babies are tame or that they're very calm and they don't mind being pet, but actually it's a survival strategy. They, they stay still to hide from predators and they could be in shock. So it's really important. They're, they don't enjoy being touched um, and to leave them where you find them. So uh, a, a Eastern cottontail can actually fend for themselves if their eyes are open, if they're around four inches long, if their ears are standing up, so they don't need care from their parents or from people. So in that stage, um, usually if they're around the size of the pump, your hand or the size of a dollar bill, their eyes are open, their ears are up, they don't need any help. So um, in times though, that you need to intervene is when if a dog or a cat had a baby bunny in their mouth, it can pass, um, unfortunately, germs to the baby that could be detrimental. So then they should see a wildlife rehabilitator. Or if there's evidence of bleeding or flies around, that's when you can intervene and contact a wildlife rehabilitator. So if you do have a rabbit's nest in your backyard, they will usually take around a month to leave the nest. So it's not too long to keep your dog on a leash or your cat indoors, and it's not recommended to ever move the nest. All right. And um, yes, I do see a comment in the chat, um, Jane, about how when you do have um, a lawnmower, that it is important to check in your backyard to look around for uh, rabbit nests or birds that may have fallen. So that's one thing that you can do to help is to check your backyard before using a lawnmower. All right, so moving on to rodents and uh, actually rabbits are not rodents. They're in the Lagomorph family, but gray squirrels are rodents and they're one of the first babies that are being born in our area. They can be born in February. So the eastern gray squirrel can have two to four babies at a time and up to two litters a year. Sometimes they'll nest in tree cavities and sometimes they'll um, gather leaves and build nests up in a tree, in the crook of a tree. And the babies are born without any fur and their eyes are closed. But usually you won't see them because they're being born in a nest or in the inside of a tree and they'll leave the nest between 10 to 12 weeks old. So these are some pictures of some gray squirrels that were taken at the refuge and some, some babies that had emerged from that tree cavity. And they're fully born, fully grown at around nine months old. So squirrels, they need help if the baby is approaching people, if they're cold and their eyes are closed. And if you suspect that there's a nest around or if the mother is nearby, you can actually first, before removing the baby, you can put the baby in a box outside near where you suspect the mother is or where the nest is with a warm water bottle and until nightfall. And the mother will come back if she's around and retrieve the baby. 
but she won't come back if the baby's cold. So that's why it's important to have a warm water bottle if you do have one of those in there with the baby. So again, um, if, you, if it is injured or still needs help, its eyes are closed and it's cold, um, you can give the baby water, um, just don't touch them. And the most important thing is don't feed them, don't give them water, but keep them warm until a wildlife rehabilitator um, gives you some more advice. So chipmunks, um, they can have two litters starting in April and then another in July. And their diet includes seeds, berries, snails. Um, they're rodents, they dig really complex burrows that are usually around two feet underground. They can stretch 10 feet. Um, and then they have two to five tiny young. And they'll start taking trips out of the burrow at around six weeks. So we that's why you hardly ever see baby chipmunks. Um, so it's very rare to find a chipmunk that needs help because they're spending almost all of their time in the burrow. They're fully weaned at about 10 weeks. But if you see a baby that's eyes are unopened, it doesn't have a lot of fur or it's visibly injured, uh, that is when you can contact a wildlife rehabilitator. You wanna put them in a small shallow box. Um, it's important also to use a towel that's non-looping so that they don't get wrapped up in the towel or stuck in the towel with their, their feet. And um, also, if you do see a baby chipmunk that needs help, you can do the same thing. If you suspect the mom's nearby, you can put them in a box that she can come and get them. Okay, and another rodent, of course, is groundhogs. Similar to chipmunks, they dig burrows, but they hibernate until there's enough vegetation to eat. So they'll start emerging maybe at the end of March and April when we start having um, a lot more things for groundhogs to eat. So their, their two to six babies are born in around April and May, but they're born in the burrow. There's a special chamber, just like for chipmunks, there's a nursery chamber. And um, they're born with closed eyes and hairless. So if you do see, again, a, a baby that it has closed eyes and is hairless, it would need help from its parents. But if their eyes are open and they're um, furred, then they wouldn't need any help. And this is our groundhog that we take care of here at the refuge, um, just being adorable. And our, our groundhog was actually found as a baby. He was injured though by a car. So then he was brought to a wildlife rehabber where he was rehabbed but non-releasable due to his injuries. All right, so white-tailed deer are usually born in the months of April um, and May. They're Long Island's largest mammal. And they can have between one to three fawns, but usually they will have a one fawn. And until the fawns are strong enough, they will be left alone almost all day. So the mother will only come back at dawn or dusk, just like rabbits, to hide the young from predators. Um, sometimes they'll come back four times a day if the, the fawns are really young to nurse. And the fawns are around six to eight pounds when they're born, but it is important to know that, and it is totally normal for the fawn to be alone. So the fawn should be alone most of the time, but if you see a fawn walking around or crying, if there are flies or visible wounds on the fawn, then it is important to contact a wildlife rehabilitator, but um, very also important not to feed or transport the fawn on your own. But again, um, totally normal for the fawn to be laying down and resting throughout the day because the mom will come back and feed them at dawn and dusk. Okay, possums, which are North America's only native marsupial. These are some really cool mammals that don't make a nest. They instead, since they are marsupials like kangaroos and koalas, when their babies are born, they'll travel to the mother's pouch where they nurse in the pouch. So um, possums are fascinating. They have a gestational period of 12 to 13 days. When their babies are born, they're around the size of a honeybee. So they're extremely small. They don't have any fur and their eyes are closed, but they travel into the pouch where they'll spend around 60 days in the pouch growing. And after a week, the babies triple in size and they'll stay with their mother for three to four months. And these are some pictures of um, some possums that we've had at the refuge or have at the refuge. And at 
at some point, the babies will uh, come out of the pouch after around 60 days, and they will spend some time with their mom still learning from their mom and foraging, but um, they'll also spend some time on the mother's back. So that's a, a picture of a possum with some of the babies on her back there. They'll usually spend their time in trees or on the ground, but because they're nocturnal, you usually won't come across possums. Um, but if you do notice that one is injured, you can definitely contact a wildlife rehabilitator. They, possums rarely contract rabies because their body temperature is too low, but it's important to never handle any wildlife um, if you're not a trained professional. So very important not to touch them. And raccoons, um, so raccoons, again, just like possums, are a nocturnal mammal. Their babies are born in April and May, and they have two to five babies or kits in their litters. They're, they're born with their eyes closed, so they do need parental care and they need to nurse, but they start moving around after six weeks. And female raccoons might stay with their mother through the next spring, so they might stay together in a family group until uh, a year. Um, males will usually leave their mom in the fall. But one of the best ways to help raccoons, possums, squirrels is to avoid taking trees down between March and September. So now we really shouldn't, we don't want to take any trees down to prevent the disruption of cavity nesters, especially animals like raccoons and birds that will nest in the inside of trees. So this is just a short video that I wanted to play. Um, showing you, I'm going to play it a little faster than it normally would play, but this is um, a video that I found showing a raccoon mom collecting a baby. So the baby was separated from the mom, but this was a special um, box from um, a wildlife control agency. So reuniting the family instead of, you know, um, euthanizing or taking the baby to a rehabber, but they just put the, the baby in this box where it was closed off and warm. So it's not getting wet. And if a mother hears the baby, she'll come back and collect the baby and move it to a new location. So mom knows best. And it's important to remember that uh, wild animals should always be raised by their parents to, to learn. So bats, raccoons, and skunks are considered three rabies vector species in New York State. And a small percentage of animals have rabies, but it's really important to never handle any wildlife and especially any of these three species. So bats, raccoons, and skunks. But you can call a licensed wildlife rehabil rehabilitator who is a class two rehabber. So they're trained to, to handle and rehabilitate rabies vector species. And uh, moving on to bats. Bats are amazing um, animals. They eat thousands of mosquitoes every night. So we love seeing bats at the refuge and um, they, will, they will gestate from between 50 to 60 days. They're usually born in May, but usually late June and early July. And the babies will stay on their mother. Um, they'll stay with her and nurse where her, she'll, they'll drink milk because they are mammals. Um, but it if a baby can't fly, they'll actually start to fly after three weeks. If they can't fly yet and they had fallen off their mother or they were injured, you might see them on the ground. Um, so it's important to make sure that you, if you do find um, a bat that needs help, it needs to go to a wildlife rehabilitator to never handle them with your bare hands, but always call for advice. Um, if you otherwise, if maybe there's trees um, being cut down in your area and you notice another bat that looks totally fine and is on the ground, one thing to know biologically is that bats need to climb up a tree to swoop down and start flying. So they can't fly from the ground like a, a bird can. And they have to be able to climb up onto a tree and then turn around and glide off the tree. So if you suspect that a bat just happen to be grounded and is working its way to a tree, you can just let them do their thing. They will climb up a tree and then when night falls, they will be some perfect mosquito control for your backyard. And then um, seals, are, of course, are mammals as well. 
And we'll see seals in our area along beaches, they'll spend their winters here. So harbor seals, gray, harp, hooded, and ring seals can be found on Long Island in the winter months and through the early spring. So some young seals might haul out on a local beach and rest in the winter and early spring. And it's um, very important to make sure to stay at least 150 feet away from seals, not only to prevent them from becoming stressed or going back into the water when they're resting, but because it is illegal to do that as well. Um, they're protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And if you're on a, a beach where there's a seal, it's um, you should keep your dogs leashed so that they don't scare seals into the water or injure them. And then if you do suspect the seal is injured, um, I have a resource for you at the end of this presentation. And then now moving on to turtles, one of my favorite animals, they are their eggs are usually laid between May, June, and July, and the hatchlings will emerge in August and September. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about snakes and other reptiles, but mostly about turtles. Um, because it is so rare to see young snakes, uh, I didn't really cover it too much, but it's something that can, is certainly possible and young snakes would be born in the springtime when our area is warming up because they are cold-blooded. But Unlike the mammals that we discussed, reptiles are born, um, they hatch out of an egg that usually is laid underground and they don't need any parental care. So they are born and know exactly what to do. They have their instincts and they don't need any parental care. They don't drink milk from their parents. And these are, this is just a collection of photos of some reptiles and amphibians that have been seen at the refuge. Um, so these frogs will be born in water, so they're amphibians, so the, the toads, bullfrog, tree frog, pickerel, and the redback salamander, all of those animals will, their eggs will be laid in water, while the reptiles, their eggs are laid on land. So these are some hatchlings. I just wanted to show you the difference between some of the species um, if you see a hatchling turtle, they're usually around the size of a quarter. You can see um, this little snapping turtle here is around the size of a quarter. An eastern box turtle and an eastern painted turtle. These are the most common three turtle species that we see at the refuge. And occasionally hikers will see some of these hatchlings and bring them into the nature center. Um, and they're really well-meaning. They're trying to help the turtles, but it's actually best to always leave an animal where you find them because these hatchlings don't need any help from people. They're born in their perfect habitat. So uh, by moving them, say if someone thought that this Eastern box turtle was an aquatic species and they put it in the water, that can be really detrimental to those animals because Eastern box turtles live on land. So it's really important to never move any hatchlings, to never pick up hatchlings. It can be stressful for them um, and to just leave them where you find them. But another um, hatchling that you might see on on bays or on beaches is the diamondback terrapin because they live near brackish water. All right, so um, these are some photos that were taken at the refuge, but so should you help if you find an adorable hatchling box turtle? If you see a box turtle standing still, should you help if there's a, a muddy baby snapping turtle? And if the turtle has a flower on its beak, this was a great picture that was in our butterfly garden. No, right? These turtles don't need any help. Nine times out of 10, if you see a turtle, it's in a perfect habitat for them. They don't need any help, but we will discuss some ways to help them. So if you see blood, um, if there are flies around a turtle or if it has swollen ears, you can contact a wildlife rehabilitator. And if you see a turtle that's crossing the road, it can be a really dangerous place for these slow moving animals. So if you see a turtle crossing the road, you can help it in the direction that it's traveling. So for this turtle, um, you can move it. Does anyone know which direction you would move this turtle already? So for this turtle, you'd want to move it 
to the direction that it's walking, so to the left. And even if it was a snapping turtle and say there was water on the right and there's only land on the left, you still always want to move them in the direction that they're walking. That aquatic turtle could be going to lay its eggs on the other side of the road. So if you turn it around and move it in the opposite way, it will it knows exactly what it wants to do and will turn and go the way that it wants. Um, and I see a great question from Jane. If you do see a turtle that's upside down, um, sometimes they can turn themselves right side up, but I, it wouldn't hurt them to just quickly um, put them right side up and then wash your hands. So I don't think that would hurt at all. But um, it is important to remember for snapping turtles, they have really long um, arms and legs and also a long neck with a very strong jaw that they can reach pretty much all the way around their shell. So don't pick up any snapping turtles, but you can, if they're moving really slow, you can help them across with a stick. Um, but the road is a very dangerous place for people and for turtles. So just make sure to be careful. All right, and if you do truly find an injured wildlife, um, you can call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So on the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's website, they have um, an option where you can go to their website, select your county, and then select the type of animal that you are that needs care. And then you can see a list of wildlife rehab rehabilitators that are licensed in our area. And it usually has some contact information for them. Um, you can also call us here at the Quag Wildlife Refuge and we can help you find um, the best organization to contact too. But there are um, a great organizations near us, wildlife rescue centers locally that I have a list here um, and also on our website, we have these organizations listed. So it depends on the area, some rescue centers will intake um, and serve their local area. So it's important to call them for any advice if you find um, an injured wildlife. And in terms of um, seals and sea turtles, the New York Marine Rescue Center is licensed to treat those animals. And then on our website, this is a screenshot of our website, but you can visit our resources tab and visit wildlife resources for some more advice on what to do if you find an animal that needs help. But um, some, some tips are from, from us would be to, if you have a shoe box, you can save that and put some holes in it to be ready just in case you come across an animal. Um, you might have a, a hot water bottle that you can use in case uh, you, you know, a parent is nearby and the mom can come and collect the baby while the baby's still warm. And um, one thing that I'm a really big fan of, if you do have a swimming pool or an in-ground pool in your backyard, is this product from Amazon that's called a frog log. And basically it just creates a ramp so that if an animal gets into the pool, it can get out of the pool without needing any help and it won't drown. So I actually have have really good success with a frog log. And um, it one time, just a quick story, there was a bat that accidentally got into our swimming pool. And because we had the frog log, the bat swam over to the, the platform and was able to rest there. And then in the morning I saw it and we just put it at the base of a tree and um, it climbed up the tree and was totally fine. So frog logs are a really good investment and they're actually not very expensive. Um, but yeah, some other options for that could just be like Jane says, a two by four with an end in the water and at the other edge of the pool deck. So that's, that's a great way to help wildlife if they accidentally get into your pool. Um, and then other ways to help them could be if you have a soccer net in your backyard, you can take that down when it's not in use. Um, and I know I've seen news stories of owls and deer being caught in sports netting, so you can take that down. Um, it's important not to feed wildlife, um, especially animals that can become habituated to people like squirrels, um, mammals, and, and birds like ducks and geese to not feed them bread. And saying no to glue traps and to using rat poison can be really helpful. A lot of animals will get trapped in glue traps um, and it's not a humane way to handle uh, a pest population. 
And then rat poison can have really cascading effects on populations of raptors. So um, sometimes when mice and rats eat rat poison and they die, predator animals will then eat the, the animals that were poisoned and then have those poisons in their body. Um, so again, if you do see a baby a wildlife or an injured animal, never give food or water to them because um, it can actually cause them to aspirate and it can be really harmful to their health. And another great thing that you can do if you really want to help wildlife is to plant native plants in your backyard and don't use pesticides. So uh, this is a photo of our butterfly garden at the refuge and there's a new initiative that we have. Um, you can learn more on our website about some local garden centers who are committing to sell native plants. And native plants are great for native pollinators, for birds. Um, it helps all of our native wildlife be it, because of food sources. Um, and if you don't use pesticides in your area, that's a really great way to help pollinators, native wildlife. And this is a photo of a box, a box turtle with an oral abscess. And oral abscesses, it just looks like it has swollen ears. And those abscesses are actually tied to organochlorines in compounds that are in the environment from chemicals. So it's very important. If you find a, a turtle that has an oral abscess, definitely contact a wildlife rehabilitator and they can help that turtle, but by not spraying pesticides or insecticides in our backyards, we can really help wildlife that live on the ground and that come to our area to eat. All right, so does anyone have any questions? I will go ahead and allow um, folks to unmute. Let me do that now. Okay, so I think you should have the um, ability to unmute yourself. And if you raise your hand, I think, um, and people should be able to do that on that little icon, I can unmute you too. But I will go and see if there's any questions in the chat. Oh, so I see a really good question. Um, so water quality is declining in the pond along Scuttlehole Road because so many geese are staying there. Is there a number of geese that an acreage can support? And when is it considered too populated? Um, that's a really great question, Marianne. I know that you know every environment has a carrying capacity of the amount of wildlife that it can support. And in a lot of cases, um, ducks and geese, because they're migratory, they might spend some time in an area and then move on. So I'm not sure, um, because they are probably overwintering, they're not necessarily feeding off of that habitat for their, you know, the, their whole lifespan. They'll probably move on soon. And um, so I'm not sure about how much, uh, how many um, acres a a habitat can support in terms of how many birds um, or geese. So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for, for you. Oh, and uh, a good question from Anthony, do muskrats play possum? And, you know, I actually don't know. I'm not sure if muskrats ever um, play possum or pretend to be dead to evade predators. Um, but that I will definitely look that up. And wh what I think I'll do is um, email all the participants the recording, send you some links to um, the DEC's website and so that you can find any wildlife rehabilitators. And then maybe I can look into that question. That's a great question. And then yes, you can definitely rewatch this presentation. I'll send everyone the recording and please feel free to spread the word about um, what to do with wildlife. You can send this presentation to friends and family or neighbors. And uh, you, when, yes, yeah, so I think that, that um, a lot of people, sometimes it can be a misconception or um, that the DEC will, you know, um, put animals down. And in certain cases, it could be tied to you know, diseases that they can carry. Um, but the DEC will usually refer you to wildlife rehabilitators. So um, 
there are a good list. I will definitely send out that list of wildlife rehabilitators in our area. And then um, it's, it's important to contact them because they know exactly what to do and have a lot of experience in rehabbing wildlife. All right, I see some more questions. Um, but yes, I will email the uh, recorded presentation. And um, a question from Patty, who has a lot of birds, feeders for for birds in your backyard, and there can there are many feral cat colonies, and the possum and raccoons eat the dry cat food. Is that harmful to them? Okay, so um, it's it's not bad to have bird feeders out as long as you clean your bird feeders. Um, usually, once a month, you can take down your bird feeders and clean them, and that will prevent any diseases from being transferred from bird to bird at a bird feeder. But um, Eating high quality food like black oil sunflower seeds is, is really great for birds, migratory birds that are passing through. And just as long as you're, we're keeping the feeders clean, um, that's great. And then um, in terms of possums and raccoons eating the dry cat food, it's not ideal for them to eat it because they can become habituated and um, it could be dangerous if there's a road nearby. But um, and uh, if they're associating people with being fed, then that can be dangerous for them. So sometimes what will, what can be done for if you're feeding feral cats is that you can put it out at a certain time and take it in bef and the cats will come um, usually before the sun goes down. If you can get the cats to respond to you when you're outside feeding them and then take in the dishes or the extra food before the possums and raccoons can come and eat it. So that would be ideal. Awesome. Great. Yes, please um, visit our website. We have some great or garden centers that have committed to supplying native plants. And we have that whole list on our website of great places that you can get them. All right. And then um, it, I see a question from Darlene about providing water year round. And you can definitely provide a bird feeder in your yard uh, or a place for birds to come and get water, a shallow basin is best. And you can also put one out with rocks in it, just a little bit of water for pollinators to come and drink from. That can be really helpful because sometimes pollinators have a hard time getting water. If it's deep water, they, um, they can't really swim. And a question from Marianne, uh, how do we keep cats away from nesting birds? And it is really hard to keep cats away because they are predators and they're following their instincts. But one thing that you can do is put a bell on a collar of a cat and that will scare birds away. Um, from nesting birds is hard because they can't fly yet. So I would try to keep cats inside if you can. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And um, I will put my email in the chat so that you can send any more questions my way. And um, one last question, does water in shallow bird feeders become mosquito breeding sources? Um, and it could, one thing that you can do is put um, a fountain. If you, you can actually buy, I think they're solar powered water um, fountains and that will keep the water moving so mosquitoes don't breed in the water but you can also change it out every day or two yeah and you can change it out daily and then you won't have a problem with um, mosquito larva excellent well thank you guys so much i know i'm really excited for spring and excited that we're all out there helping wildlife um, please feel free to ever, you know, contact us at the refuge and 